Hey there, Fat Man Skeletor here, and welcome to Zeitgeist OG. Welcome, welcome, and uh, today we are going through the top 10 best movies of 2020. And uh, something to note here is that one of us has watched all of the movies this year, and one of us has literally not seen a si Wait. Onward was 2020. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was. One of us has seen one movie in 2020. <laughs> okay, so your best movie of the year would be... My best movie of the year would be Onward, and my worst movie of the year would also be Onward. All right, because well... that is the only movie I've seen this year. Oh, thanks for coming, people. That's the show, and uh, <laughs> we'll catch you next time. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do Skeletor's Top Ten, and uh, I'm going to be going through the list here, and he's going to tell me why each one deserved that spot on the list. Without further ado, so number ten. Once told they'd save the universe during a time-traveling adventure. Two would-be rockers from San Dimas, California, find themselves as middle-aged dads still trying to crank out a hit song and fulfill their destiny. And of course, we are talking about Bill and Ted Face the Music. Uh, number 10, why? Um, well, this was kind of return to form for the franchise as a whole, and uh, definitely for Alex Winter. He hasn't really done much acting-wise for quite a while. Yeah, no, he's been uh, he's been out of play for a minute. Well, no, he's, he's been doing a lot of directing. But he, he hasn't been in front of the camera. But, uh, no, he, he definitely carries all the weight of this movie. Um, really? I, I don't know why, but for some reason, uh, Keanu Reeves just decided to phone it in. Wow, and he's the one that was really campaigning for a third Bill and Ted movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. When you watch the behind-the-scenes stuff, he's he seems like he really wants this to happen. I know he was a driving force in this for a while. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's crazy, too, because it's like, I, I really like the first two Bill and Ted's. I don't know oh, why hell I haven't yeah. around to this one yet. Uh, but yeah, any time I heard anybody talking about it, it was Keanu, like, hardcore, like, let's do this, and Alex Winter was like, hey man, if it happens, I'm game. Yeah, exactly. The The guy who seemed the most apathetic is the guy who is the most convincing actor out of everybody in that movie. The, uh, the, the issues with it, though, the reason it is the worst of the best is it kind of craps on the previous two movies, Princesses. They feel like they're, they had a whole storyline that was cut out of the movie. The daughters are alright, but it, it's kind of a rehash of, of the first movie. Could be better. Definitely could be a hell of a lot worse. Okay. So uh, we are moving on to your number nine pick for the year. And a secluded farm is struck by a strange meteorite which has apocalyptic consequences for the family living there and possibly the world. If you are like me, you've never even heard of this thing. Number nine for you is Color Out of Space. Yes, I am. Based on a uh, short uh, Lovecraft story. I am a huge fan of Lovecraft. I really love this story. This is one of those things where I, I think if it hadn't have been marketed as a Lovecraft movie, it actually would have done a lot better. He does have, like, a very niche audience. He does, but beyond that, his work doesn't translate well visually. That said, though, it, it, it was a good movie. Nick Cage and the chick who played his daughter, who uh, I can't Mad remember. Madeline Arthur. The two of them definitely carried the weight of the movie. Uh, there was there was one creepy scene, you know, with the wife and the kid, but ultimately Nick Cage and, and Natalie carried the movie. Um, and when it came time for Nick Cage to go crazy, he definitely did that with flying <laughs> colors. And uh, the gore effects, the body horror, the llamas fusing together... <laughs> That was pretty good. The kid fusing together with the mom. That was amazing. Uh, there's definitely a reason to watch this movie. Okay. We're moving on to your number eight pick, and I have to ask, are you four? <laughs> uh, because number eight for you is Trolls World Tour. Uh, when the queen of the Hard Rock Trolls tries to take over all of the Troll Kingdoms, Queen Poppy and her friends try different ways to save all the trolls. So please tell me, because I am interested, why... Trolls 2. Okay, first off, I would like to remind you, we actually did a trailer reaction for this. We did. I remember that. It got like 3,000 some views. Uh, that alone made me think we should review it. But also, um, I, I gotta be honest, the first time I saw this, I was tripping pretty hard on acid. Okay. That makes sense. That said, um, it caught my attention enough that I came back to it when I was sober, and it was still a good movie. They're doing things here with animation that uh, I, I, I didn't think that we would be saying like the, the CGI in this wow. is absolutely outstanding that's a, that's a ringing endorsement and I, I will actually say that I will poke fun at trolls but uh, for anybody who knows me knows that I'm a huge animation buff I've seen everything from Toy Story to Igor to Breadwinner you've I've, seen everything Disney's ever made almost yeah I, 
Pixar, DreamWorks, all of it. Like, I, I love this type of stuff. Like, I've sat through Turbo. Like, I this is Ooh. what I like. Um, and I have actually had people tell me before that Trolls is a sleeper hit. Like, it's I've heard it's a lot better than you would think it would be. Oh, yeah, no, there's, there's definitely a range of music along with it. If you're not into pop, there's definitely something here for you. And I think that makes it a bit more accessible to a wider audience than the first movie was. That said, everything you're going to hear is some typical radio stuff. It's nothing too obscure, nothing too out of the way, but it, it is all good songs. Okay. All right, moving on to your number seven pick, a movie I am actually ashamed I have not seen. We are talking about Scoob. So Scooby and the gang face their most challenging mystery ever, a plot to unleash the ghost dog Cerberus upon the world. As they race to stop this dog apocalypse, <laughs> the gang discovers that Scooby has an epic destiny greater than anyone imagined. I am wholeheartedly ashamed, especially because you gave me this movie, so I do have it. I just haven't seen it yet. It, it's definitely good. It's definitely good. I was very worried they were gonna hit that Spider-Man 3 issue of ham fistly cramming too many cameos in. because yeah, this sets up, like, the universe, right? Yes, the Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe. What a mouthful. Um, yeah, no, they, they definitely spend a lot of time setting that up, but it feels pretty natural the entire time with the exception of the caveman stuff, because when you get there and you see that, it's, why don't you guys just join the rest of society? What, what's going on here? It, it definitely sets up for a wider story. It is an origin story as well. Um, that said, it, there's a few low points, but overall, it, it's definitely pretty good. The animation only really lacks from the art style itself. It, it's all very well made. I do look forward to sitting down and watching that. Uh, let me show you the way to your number six pick, which is Sonic the Hedgehog. After discovering a small, blue, fast hedgehog, a small-town police officer must help him defeat an evil genius who wants to do experiments on him. Take away the police officer, and this could apply to several things. Crash Bandicoot comes to mind. What makes Sonic stick out? Well, first off, there's a small town police officer. There, there's no small town police officer in Crash Bandicoot. Well, there's, a, there's an ancient tiki mask. It's the same thing. Yeah, you're right. Those two are completely interchangeable. I'm, I'm not a big Sonic fan. I, I've played the, the first game yeah. or two on Sega, and I caught a few episodes of Sonic X in between episodes of Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. The only Sonic thing that I ever watched start to finish with Sonic Underground, and that was music-related, so that's probably... Hey, I like That wasn't Sonic. good. What? Anyway, but, uh, I mean, you, you gotta understand, this is 2020, uh, the whole big corona thing just, just messed up the entire movie theater experience, and you kinda have to change your grading scale to go along with that. Uh, in a normal year, this, this would have been, like, a, a, a 3 or a 4, but it's 2020, so guess what? Sonic is, is pretty high in that list. <laughs> it's elevated by the mediocrity of everything else around it. Sonic was definitely enjoyable, and I'd have to say the best part was definitely Jim Carrey. Yeah, I heard that was, uh, I've heard that was a big return to form, and he finally stopped corporate shilling and was actually fun again. Oh, yeah, no, I was, I was getting some hardcore Ace Ventura vibes. That was peak 90s Jim Carrey right there. I, I can't wait to see more of him in the sequel. Uh, so, number five. Again, if you're like me, you had no idea that a 2020 version of this even existed. But a house is cursed by a vengeful ghost that dooms those who enter it with a violent death. This could literally refer to maybe four dozen horror movies, but today we're talking about The Grudge 2020. Yeah? Okay, so for a remake, or a reboot, reimagining, whatever, this is... This is really good. It goes... It doesn't just follow the same plot. What is it? Is it a reboot? Is it a remake? What What do we actually fall under here? Um, the first, I'd say, ten minutes of the movie are pretty much exactly the same as the original movie, but then where a normal person like me would watch the movie and go, okay, shit's popping off, just get out of the house. They actually do that. They leave the house, they go back home, guess what? The curse follows. And... Now shit's popping off at, at their house. And there's some time jumps between the 90s and modern day, and the police are trying to figure out what's going on. Because again, if shit's happening, let other people know. Don't just keep this to yourself. If you're being haunted, let other people know. Yeah, reach out. They do this, and it just drags other people in. 
It's uh, just screws just screws up everybody else's oh, day. Oh, nobody gets a happy ending here. Um, it, it's it's definitely a good movie. It takes a lot of twists and turns that I'm not used to seeing, and I I think are natural, logical things to do, which I really appreciate in a horror movie. Uh, that said, it's not incredibly scary. There aren't really jump scares, but it's a good, solid movie. I definitely recommend it. All right, uh, number four. What the hell? Oh, I, yeah. I never gave them permission to do this. Number four is Fat Man, and I, I don't... Oh, you got drunk. You're technically under uh, Zeitgeist's copyright, so I just sold you off. What the hell? I don't recall. I, I like the... I mean, the name is catchy, though. I'll give them that. It's very catchy. Uh, so this movie is obviously about a handsome young man with a great head of hair, but for shits and giggles, a rowdy, unorthodox Santa Claus is fighting to save his declining business. Meanwhile, Billy, a neglected... A neglected and precocious 12-year-old hires a hitman to kill Santa after receiving a lump of coal in his stocking. Well, it sounds like something I'd do. Yeah. But I'm Arabic, so Santa has skipped my house every day for the last 26 years. Oh, it's not about religion. It's just about <laughs> being good or bad. Ah, uh, well, the binge drinking and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're uh, to do yeah. going to hell, but All not right, for why, that. Besides, uh, besides the obvious reason, why <laughs> is Fat Man absolutely fantastic? Tell us, Skeletor. Uh, well, Mel Gibson definitely uh, holds up a great performance. Uh, he plays Santa Claus, if you uh, don't already know. I do like I see that Walton Goggins is in this, and I do like him a lot. It, it, it's a good movie. It's a very good movie. It's it's basically just Santa at his ranch slash workshop. You know, Santa's little his thing. elfish slave camp. I'm not gonna say slave camp, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's there's definitely some factory vibes. Yeah, no, Santa Santa goes on his Christmas run, gives a kid some coal because he's like, screw it. If, if I'm not gonna be giving out presents, I might as well start giving out coal again. Makes sense. The kid gets upset, sends a hitman after Santa, and uh, Santa has set up kind of like a a contract deal with the U.S. government to start making weapons because elves are great at making things, right? And uh, the the hitman. Makes sense. Shows up and just... <laughs> no further questions. Cuts through the military <laughs> with the greatest of ease. And it just comes down to a shootout between Santa and the Hitman in the snow. And it, it's it's a very fun movie. My it, only real issue... It sounds like it, yeah. It, it definitely is. It definitely is. Uh, my only real issue is that we don't get to see him delivering the gifts. We see uh, him getting ready to head out Christmas night. He gets on the sleigh and takes off, and then we cut to him sneaking into the house Christmas morning, and he's nursing a gunshot wound. So a little anticlimactic, but it sounds like an interesting enough premise. I think they skipped it for budgetary reasons, but yeah, no, it's definitely an interesting it premise. Could. I've literally not heard of this movie before just now, so... It just came out. It's brand new, even as of recording this video. All right, so we jump to your number three. Uh, so we actually have a documentary here, here. That's cool. I don't think we've had one of those on here before. No, but, we have not. Uh, artist Matt Fury, creator of the comic character and meme legend, Pepe the Frog, begins an uphill battle to take back his iconic cartoon image from those who used it for their own purposes. So feels good, man. Documentary all about the most... If I may be so bold, the most legendary meme of all time. Yeah, he might be. Uh, let me hear it, because, again, this one is a movie you gave me that I just haven't watched. Yeah, no, you definitely got to get around to saying this. Um, it's a good documentary, and I, I do enjoy a good documentary. Ken Burns' Prohibition is my favorite, but uh, this one, for an hour and a half, it, it keeps things moving along very quickly. Um... There's never a point where it feels dull or, like, yeah, nothing drags. The, the thing I always look for in a documentary is, am I learning something the entire time? This thing oh, is you're learning. Not, this is pointless. Yeah, no, you're going to be learning a lot with this thing. There's, it's basically a, a three-pronged story. You've got Pepe and his origins and where he goes across the internet. And then you've got the creator and his side of the story. And then you've got the creator's friends and family and their side of the story. And between the two, you can kind of piece together what the truth really yeah, is. Yeah. Um, I don't want to really give away too much here, but it, it's it's pretty funny, all things considered. I think the only real downside is the fact that each segment of the documentary is like 10 minutes on the dot before moving on to the next part. So it, it does kind of feel almost like you can kind of predict when you're going to move on to the next part. Like, oh, we're about to wrap this segment up. Other than that, though, 
it, it's definitely an interesting watch. You learn a few things, and there's an animated intro at the beginning from the creator. That's awesome. Beautifully done, specifically just for this. Just from the poster, I like this one. Oh yeah, very colorful. So we are moving on, man. We're top three. That was the first top three. We're moving on to your number two pick. Ironically, your number two is Lupin the Third, the first, at number second. So, <laughs> Lupin the Third goes on a grand adventure to uncover the secrets of the Bresson Diary, which is tied to the legacy of his famous grandfather, who I can only presume is Lupin the Second because I've not seen the anime. Yes, grandfather is the second, Lupin himself is the third, and the first is the fact that this is the first movie. This makes so much sense, it's almost as convoluted as Kingdom Hearts, I dig it. Yeah, no, it's a mouthful. Alright, so, honestly, this was going to be my number one pick for the year. It is brand new, just came out. So what changed your mind about it? Why, why isn't this number one? Because at number two, it's obviously a movie you like to show. Oh, time. hell yeah. My real issue with it, it's not even really an issue. The only reason it's not number one is because it does kind of rely on needing to know who Lupin is or being aware of the franchise to begin with. Okay, so it doesn't do a good job of standing on its own accord. Well, that to be fair, that's international movies in general. I mean, this is a Japanese thing. That's true, and and in fairness, the Japanese do just they just follow this shit a lot. Like they don't forget. Yeah. Like something Digimon related could come out ten years from now with nothing in between, and everybody still knows the deal there. Oh yeah, exactly. There, there. It's, it's a different culture. They have attention spans. Yeah, yeah, they do. That said, it is. Right on point with the Lupin anime. If you've never seen it, some old school 80s boomer stuff. It, it, it's great. It's uh, heists, action, some situations it's kind of like Saw. You gotta solve the puzzle or you're gonna die. And uh, lots of hot chicks with big boobs. And this movie is exactly that. So big anime titties, action, and high stakes, that sounds pretty dope. And not just that, but it looks absolutely amazing. Um, th this is from Toho, who usually do live action stuff, you know, guys in suits, and questionable CGI monsters. And this, honestly, th this is on par with, if not better, than something Disney and Pixar would put out. Alright, so that being said, your number one yeah, here we is... Go. <laughs> okay. This man has an Adam Sandler movie at number one, which baffles me. But despite his devotion to his hometown of Salem and its Halloween celebration, Hubie Dubious is a figure of mockery for kids and adults alike. But this year, something is going bump in the night, and it's up to Hubie to save Halloween. Your number one is Hubie Halloween. Adam Sandler's... Hubie Halloween. And, yes. And then and, and don't let this intro fool you. I'm actually incapable of hating Adam Sandler. I just had no idea you liked Adam Sandler. Oh, yeah. I, I enjoy me some Adam Sandler. Um, I am capable of hating him. There's a few movies of his that I just do not want to watch at I've all. I've literally seen every single Adam Sandler movie that's ever been made with the exception of That's My Boy and Jack and Jill. Could not sit through those two. I, I'd imagine any normal human being... <laughs> would have trouble sitting through Jack and Jill, which is why I've never even bothered, but... Yeah, no. Yeah, Hubie Halloween, why? Okay, so again, keep in mind, it's 2020, you get, you really have to skew your grading scale. You do, um, you do. That said, yeah. e even on a, a normal year, this would still be fairly high for me. This okay. is... I know, you're, you're all about the, the spooky season, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. I'm a little biased there. But ignoring that, like, much like Jim Carrey, this is kind of a return to form for Adam Sandler. This, this, is, this is very reminiscent of 90s peak Adam Sandler. This, is, this, this reminds me a lot of Waterboy in the way that he's acting. It's, it's in my list on Netflix. His acting isn't that strong in this, but honestly, it's the rest of the cast that pulls it. Since, you know, everybody's projects were canceled this year... Adam Sandler was just like, hey, you guys want to, you know, get uh, five minutes of screen time over here? Everybody pulls in a great performance. They're they're not trying to ham it up too much. Well, yeah, it's a comedy. They're not hamming it up too much. Everybody gets their five minutes of screen time, and, and they definitely make their scene memorable. Our editor had some trouble watching just because Adam Sandler's accent was uh, uh, grating. It's, yeah, it's, Again, it's, it's very much true. water boy. So, no bullshit, like, I'm not even fucking with you here, I was almost an extra in this movie. No way. Yeah. Why didn't you tell me? 
Well, because it, like, COVID kind of screwed everything up. Uh, cause <laughs> it was easier if you weren't... Ex- they were looking for extras from, like, the filming location. But there was... They, they were willing to take extras from not that area. And, uh... Yeah, I was like, I'm sure I wouldn't have been doing shit. I think it was for some, like, party scene or something, but... I think I know what you're talking about. But yeah, almost, almost, uh, Mr. Fat Man was almost in the background of an Adam Sandler movie, which would have been kind of dope. Your whole career could have kicked off right then and there. Oh, right there, that could have been it, man. If only it wasn't for the big Rona. Alright, well, that was, uh, that's definitely worth a watch. I think I've seen this, like, three or four times now. Wow, holy shit. Yeah, it's, it's good. More than I've seen. It's fun. With the exception of Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and Blues Brothers, that's more than I've seen most movies in my life. I've seen Lord of the Rings more than 20. Repeatedly. But, uh, that was our, well, that was Skeletor's top 10, I promise. For My New Year's resolution is for 2021. I'm actually going to watch, uh, if I watch two movies, that's one more than I did for 2020, so. And I'm going to have a loop in the third official review out real soon. Yeah, definitely you should. But, uh, thanks for watching. Let us know in the comments what you think the, uh, best movie of the year was. One thing I personally want to know Uh, This has been a rough year for everybody, pandemic and everything. What movie, even if it wasn't your favorite movie of the year, what movie, TV show, what just brought you some comfort through all this crap this year? Like, what was your comfort zone movie or show or even if it's an episode or just something? What made you feel like it was going to be okay? I'm interested to know that. So hit that bell, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you later. We've been Fat Man and Skeletor. This has been some Zeitgeist OG. See you.